And after it completes, we now have a full hour of time per warp zone. Big biters, here we come. Well, not so fast. Those big biters are going to come with big armor. Eight physical armor to be exact. That means our gun turrets are no good, as they currently output less than 8 damage, which makes big biters blatantly bulletproof. And we've got a mere 13 minutes to do something about it. Fortunately, the added Warptorio technologies come to the rescue yet again. We can research two more damage upgrades. The regular one, which gives 10% bonus damage, and the Warptorio one, which gives 15% bonus damage. As gun turrets benefit from each upgrade twice, that should push their damage high enough to deal with an occasional big biter, I hope. The other improvement we could make is upgrading to red ammo, but it's almost 3 times the price while only doing 60% more damage. Since our objective is to minimize unnecessary resource consumption, we're going to try to stick to yellow ammo for as long as we possibly can. After adding the doubled red science requirements to the respective chests again, let's put down two gun turrets with both ammo types, so we can see the damage upgrades happening as the technology is complete. We should also remember to keep on smelting steel if we have the iron to spare, because we're gonna need a lot of it. Not only do we need it for military and blue signs, we also need it for expanding the base with assemblers, chemical plants, oil refineries, pump jacks, power lines and more. Anyway, at the moment there's not much else to do, so I decide to film this long time lapse instead, showcasing the gun turret's damage increase with the next two technologies completing. We went from 7.8 to 11.25 raw damage output, which means we can now damage big biters with yellow ammo for a whopping 2.9 damage per bullet. At this point, with yellow ammo just barely overcoming the big biters armor, red ammo would actually be superior to the lead big biters, as with a net 9 damage per bullet, it would kill them at the same resource cost, but faster. But against the combined mixed enemy forces, red ammo would still be roughly twice as expensive. With big biter preparation out of the way, we can focus on the factory again. And the first thing we're going for is a bigger factory floor. The lab research speed only took us so far. We just need more space for more labs. Meanwhile, the coal belt has stopped moving. All coal chests are full by now, so we simply stash some coal over in our personal chests to keep the belt flowing. It may look like we're stashing way too much coal. Because we are. This is the last chest of copper we have remaining. And we really should switch to copper mining instead of filming another time lapse. Anyway, factory floor 3 complete. And suddenly we have 4 more tiles of factory all around us. That means we can finally recommission all of the 40 labs we used in our temporary research stations in the early game. And we will be able to blaze as fast through future technologies as we can produce the science packs. Nice! We are not going to redesign the entire base to make optimal use of the new floor space, as the opportunity cost of reconstruction would just be too high. We are going to make giant leaps like an Olympic triple jumper and skip over as many small optimization steps as we can. Our 
Our next research goal is advanced electronics, which unlocks red chips. Not because we are planning to actually make those anytime soon, but because it allows us to find red chips in loot chests. That's right, instead of needing to set up oil, pump jacks, pipes and the whole effing oil industry together with dozens of assemblers and whatnot, we can simply find our first handful of red chips in loot chests. That will be extremely convenient for things like making the modular armor or a couple of early modules for some reason. Well, there's no sweet blueprints for this step. We are in the just tack it on phase now. Beautiful. Also, it really is the highest time to switch the coal mining platform over to copper. So, out we go, car in hand. Well, I'll come back to pick up those pipes later. Maybe. I just want to get that copper mine up ASAP. And have as little mining downtime as possible. So, let's drive, driver. Oh, the drive was a bit rough, but we have finally arrived at our beautiful copper pad. What is that? There's an enemy expansion right on our copper. And we are like 0.1% evolution away from big biters. Well, um, okay. Uh, I guess we can place the mining platform down first. It shouldn't start drawing attacks by itself for like half a minute at least. But these gun turrets will. That clears things up quite nicely. We got kind of lucky that no big biters spawned, as evolution is absolutely stompeding into the big biter era now, going up by 0.1% every 3 to 6 seconds now. By the time I have my gun turrets up and start driving off, we're already at 52%. But I forgot to do my does everything work check. And it's good we turned back as the copper belt is only half full. We forgot the four extra belts. Again. Alright, that should do it. Anyway, a quick glance at science production shows we need to resupply those once again. And for the first time, I actually have the four full chests the system was originally based on. The nine rows of iron neatly fill up our entire inventory. But unfortunately, we got rid of the chest limits already. So we are just hand feeding triple the amounts we used before. And after collecting all the remaining copper and iron from below, I'd say we made the transition to copper at right about the right time. Our water tanks are topped off, but disconnected from the water pump now that we move the coal mine. So let's see how long water actually lasts with the base running at full power. And with full power comes full production, as we get a clear shot of all of our furnaces smelting. Nice.
We are off once again to go reclaim those underground pipes we left behind. Those are still expensive enough to care about, right? <laughs> we will take a detour though, exploring new territory and hoping to get lucky with loot chests. As now with red chips finally researched, any newly generated loot chests will have a small chance to contain some red chips. We do stumble upon a loot chest, but I cannot seem to spot it. Where is it? Man, that's a stealthy chest. It spawned inside the cliff. It does not contain red chips, however. We can only find those in actually newly generated terrain. So unexplored chunks, which were already generated previously by pollution or our own proximity, would have their loot chests already generated before we researched the red chip technology, and thus cannot contain red chips. Plus, it can be pretty dangerous to accidentally trigger biters with this evolution rate. Perhaps we are better off looking for loot in the next warp zone, as all loot chests there will be newly generated ones. Pretty soon we're back at our former coal and water mine, and we start picking up our 20-some underground pipes. Was it worth the time to come back and pick up like 200 iron worth of pipes? Probably not. But what is worth it is researching more levels of toolbar, including the vanilla one, for extra inventory space. As well as unlocking all three types of modules. We do have a purpose for any early red chips we may find, which we'll get to later. But I hope to find up to 60 red chips, and I'm kind of counting on finding at least 10 to make two specific modules. Which modules? Well, let me know your predictions in the comments, and find out if you are right next time. Just kidding, the episode isn't over yet. Let's continue and aim our car through this small cliff opening. That shouldn't be too hard. Wait, what? Please tell me, Whoop, what am I crashing against? Well, I'm crashing into loads of objects actually, so let's just move attention to something else. We spot another new expansion. And we get the opportunity to check out the stats on the new big biters and spitters. Pretty beefy boys. Our turrets are starting to run out, and of course I didn't make additional ammo. I have been lacking ammo for basically all game now, haven't I? I tell ya, I would fare terrible if I actually tried to play Warptorio the intended way. So let's cheese on. We smelt some more steel. Try to move around some more coal to clear our personal chests again. And super clumsily prepare to distribute even more resources to science. But alas, there's not enough space in the chests to fit it all. So let's upgrade them to steel chests instead. Distribute another 12,000 plates to make 1200 red and green science packs. Thank you. 
hand refuel the furnaces to get rid of even more coal. By this time we see the science buffer chests are actually empty. So our 40 lap extension is doing its job well. Even if we forget to research technologies for a while, we should be able to catch up lost time with this many laps, making our strategy just a little more foolproof. And I may need it. Anyway, let's push on through our tech list. And the next thing will ultimately, and I mean like 50 hours from now, be the most powerful feature in all of Warptorio. The Warp Factory Beacon. Oh, hand trading is live. Each level unlocks one module slot, and ultimately there is 10 levels to unlock. But with red and green signs, we're going to be limited to two slots for now. Hmm, I wonder what those two modules he was speaking about earlier are going to be for. And yep, that war beacon is going to spawn right on that central patch of hazard concrete over there. Pro tip, don't build expensive stuff on hazard concrete, or it may despawn with the next upgrade of your warp factory. Alright, I'm tired of manually placing and removing gun turrets, and especially tired of forgetting to place those four extra belts on my mining platforms all the time. We are going to want to upgrade the size of those bad boys, but we need yet another 400 military signs for that. We also need an additional 200 military signs for another tech I'll get to later. So that means in total we need 600 military signs. That means we'll need another 3000 stone bricks for 600 walls again. But we didn't manage to stash away that many stone bricks earlier. We will have to mine some more stone. But it's too late to try and do that this warp zone. We can however get started on the 300 red ammo and grenades we'll need. Those will take a while to make, while the walls can be created near instantly once we eventually have the stone bricks. Instead of hand feeding assemblers like a savage, this time we'll semi automate it like a semi savage. That means we'll assign 3 assemblers to make 100 grenades each from 1000 coal and 500 iron a pop. Nice. That leaves us some room to start crafting the yellow and red ammo we need like a savage. Do you remember how even noobs know one copper wire inserter cannot keep up with one green circuit assembler? Well, one way to get around that is to switch out some copper plates for pre-made copper cable. That way we could get the green circuit assembler and with that the inserter assembler to keep working uninterrupted. At least for a while. Ok, we overproduced yellow ammo already. Well, fortunately I might add, as that means we'll finally have some ammo available for our gun turrets the next time we need it. Anyway, we are starting on red ammo. And there she is. 
the warp beacon just warped into existence. Now, despite the warp beacon looking just like an ordinary beacon, there's actually four main differences. It starts off at only one module slot instead of the regular two, but with upgrades you can get this bad boy all the way up to 10 module slots. Second, the range on this thing is absolutely humongous. It currently covers every machine on this floor and its range will grow even further with additional upgrades. The third difference is the distribution efficiency. On regular beacons that value is 0.5, meaning only half of the beacon's effects are transmitted to the machinery. However, on this warp factory beacon, the distribution efficiency is 1, which basically makes it so that every machine within reach has the same modules inside it as we put in the warp factory beacon. And currently we are already covering 75 machines. Think about that for a second. After research of the second module slot is complete, we can basically get 150 modules of value out of the two modules we choose to put in our warp beacon. That's just crazy! And obviously, we can still add additional modules in the machines themselves, to stack those additional effects on top of the warp beacon effects. And the fourth and most important difference to the warp factory beacon is... It accepts productivity modules. Yeah. And did I mention it will have 10 module slots eventually? Well, not for a long time though. We will need literal thousands of space science packs for that. But stay tuned, because by the end of the series, we are going to break the game in ways you cannot even imagine. And some of that game breakage will even be applicable to Vanilla Factorio. Well, anyway, we'll get to all that crazy power later. For now, we don't actually possess any modules just yet. So for now, it just consumes 480 kilowatts of power for absolutely no benefit at all. Suddenly, we have less than 3 minutes left on this warp zone. Let's go reclaim our miners already. Or, you know, don't. And get on with red ammo production instead? Okay, uh, anyway, it gobbles up 300 of our 365 steel, or, you know, all of our remaining steel for some reason. Come on, come on, we don't have time for this, man. Yeah, yeah, I get it, we need to replace our lost steel, but man, there's only two minutes left on the clock. You know what, let's just sit back and relax. I get the impression that playing Mike just forgot to keep an eye on the timer and he's gonna get a rude awakening once the warp alarm starts beeping a minute before warping out. <laughs> let's see how he does. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be in a hurry now, does he? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very good, yeah. We have stone bricks left for about 100 walls out of the 600 we need. There is no point in starting military science production until we have mined some additional stone. Uh oh, I think he spotted the timer, guys. <laughs> With 70 seconds to go. Run, boy, run! <laughs> The biters were far away from this platform. I don't see any significant biters. Oh, there is the alarm. And an attack. The panic is setting in now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, never mind. What a chat. Even taking the time to calmly repair the miner. Nice flex, bro. And taking the time to stash away some superfluous plates? Come on man, that's just showboating. But yeah, I guess a minute seems like plenty enough time to get our stuff back indoors with those handy mining platforms. A big improvement from the early warp zones indeed. 
Though I probably still should check for incoming attacks before deconstructing the gun turrets, perhaps we can still interpret that as a slight feint of panic. Unfortunately, no big biters come to ruin the fun just yet, in this warp zone at least. <laughs> and we safely retract the mining platforms indoors. It will warp back by itself upon warping out, but doing it manually saves it from the biters and put the platforms in our inventory already. A quick resupply on red ammo and we're out. You land with a loud metal clang. The sparkle in the ground fills you with determination. Well, that's a new one. And we'll find out what it's all about next time.